All right, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you happen to be listening to this show for the first time today, I don't know, maybe you reached out to some friends and asked, what podcast are you listening to while you're stuck at home? And they pointed you here. Welcome to you. And everyone else, what's up? I know what's up. We're at home. That's what's up. The denial's slowly wearing off. And the realization of how crazy and unprecedented it is to be just staying at home. And then the only time you go out is to like get essentials and you wear a mask and gloves. It's really surreal. And everything, all the communications, it's all digital. And I guess last week I was feeling pretty <laughs> all over about it. Now, this week I'm, I feel more level-headed about it all. But I had a particularly bad day because I decided that it was my due diligence to at least attempt to avail myself of the assistance programs that have been started for people affected by the pandemic, which is basically everyone. But they've got specific programs for gig workers like us. And so, as I've mentioned previously, I have some experience with getting SBA loans. So, I put in that application, but apparently there's no more money left, no more funding for that. So even though I got my application in on time and I had all the right documentation and I'm eligible, I'm not not holding out a lot of hope that that's going to come through for me. And then I tried to take advantage of the new PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, because normally when you're a gig worker, you can't file for unemployment. That's normally reserved for people who've got like regular jobs, like W-2s. But they got a special program now, especially for people like me, supposedly. And that was an unbelievable process. I've had to jump through some pretty difficult bureaucratic hoops before in my life, but by far trying to make it at four hours online to get this application. Unbelievable. And you know, that, that might come through. That certainly would be something, but they make it hard. They make it hard. And the last thing that really almost broke me was finding out about my wife's student loans. You see my wife, she's 45 and still paying off student loans. I'm sure there's a lot of us out there here, at least in the United States, who still got some student loans hanging around. Well, apparently, I think it was back in 2007 when they had the last financial crash. Like shortly after that, there's a lot of recommendations about, you know, refinancing your student loans because the rates were down so much. So my wife refinanced her loans And she didn't really look that closely. And why would you have? But apparently her student loan was taken over by a private lender. And so, you know, the one thing that was supposed to help us where the president said that student loans would have zero interest and no payments for six months, which would actually be really helpful to not have to make that payment for six months. That would be helpful That was the one thing that I thought we were going to at least get. And we don't get that. We have to apply and potentially we'll get three months. But it's still accrues interest. It's like (laughs) nobody's really helping. Nobody's helping. All those emails where they say, we're here to help. And then they just remind you that they have a mobile app. That's not helping. That's not helping at all. 
And I've been feeling really angry. I was really angry today. And that's not something I've felt in a long time. I have opted to just feel sad and hurt and like the root emotions. And, you know, I had a very angry time in my life and I don't, I don't find anger to be a very useful <laughs> emotional state of mind. And I have been generally successful and processing my experiences in ways where I don't feel anger like that. But, you know, I've had more friends who parents died and just it's heartbreaking to see so much injustice at a time where human beings are capable of so much more and of course human beings are rising to that moment in their own small ways in their lives despite all the injustice and ineffectiveness of our leaders. And I have certainly continued to have meaningful practice with people. And I've been recording some fantastic conversations. Speaking of which, today's guest is Ryan Cunningham. And Ryan is an old friend who was one of the first guests on the show. We talk about it. He was an early, early guest of this show. And that first conversation I had with him was not only formative for me just as I was getting my feet underneath me in this thing, but we talked about stuff that has played out in the threads of conversations on this show since. And so much has happened since he was last here, we trace back some of that, and then you'll hear. I consider Ryan a wisdom holder for me. I have learned a lot from him. And also, I want to give a shout out to his co host, Kate Robinson. Both of them host Unrolled Podcast, and I'm a big fan of theirs. Taking a moment to have this conversation with Ryan was fantastic on many levels, and I'm excited that you're getting to hear it today. Real quick, I want to take this moment to reach out to those of you who are yoga center owners and managers and wondering how you're getting through this. First, just to mention that over the next two weeks, I'll be sharing some conversations with you here with other yoga center owners, and you're going to get to hear what they're doing, and how they're getting through. But also, I want to mention today's sponsor, KarmaSoft. Long-time listeners have heard me talk about KarmaSoft before. That's the studio management software that I was using when I had my yoga center in Brooklyn. And the owner of KarmaSoft, Rudy Senegal, he's a long-time friend of mine. He's been on the show before. You should go back and listen to it. And I've been in touch with Rudy, and he has gotten together a number of different solutions for people here in terms of if you want to get your stuff online, to do that in a really clean and integrated way instead of some of the juggling that a lot of folks are having to do out there, not needing like crazy weird third-party solutions that don't work, but something that's integrated and just does what you need it to do. And this really is a moment to be reevaluating things and maybe it's a good time to make some changes. And I think that taking a look at KarmaSoft might be a good idea. So go check it out for yourself. Go to karmasoftonline.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by the support of podcast premium subscribers, Christina Nakashiba and Jennifer Cordilla. We are so grateful to Christina and Jennifer for their longtime support. Being a podcast premium subscriber is the best way to help sustain this show. And thank you so much to everybody who's doing that. You can find out about how to become a podcast premium subscriber, as well as find out about all of my stuff 
at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, that's it. I will touch base with you on the other side if you want to stick around. But for now, let's go ahead and get to this. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Ryan Cunningham. Hello? Hey, Jay. Ryan, you are here. Yes, I am. On time. On yeah, time. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and I guess we're at home anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Can you hear me okay? All levels look, look good? And- yes, thank you for being sensitive to that. Everything looks great. Thank you. Of course, of course. And it's wonderful to um, speak with you again. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> I know we, we exchange texts every now and again, so I feel like we've been in touch some. Yeah, yeah, years. for sure. But I've been wanting to talk to you again for some time. I mean, you were one of the very first people on the show. I'm actually looking it up right now. I forgot to do it before I hit go on this. I meant to. So the first time that you were on the show was back in 2015. That's insane. <laughs> yes. It was 2015. And that was really where a lot of the conversations around like, is the yoga studio model model sustainable or viable started? Yes. (laughs) Because you had uh, booked me at Back Bay Yoga where you were the manager at the time. Uh Uh-huh. And I showed up and we recorded a talk. And like the day before I had showed up, you had found out that Yoga Works was buying the place, or taking yes. it over. <laughs> and it hadn't really even been announced yet, but you knew it was happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and so that was like initially the thing that happened, that there was like the Yoga Works takeover. And there's been a lot of conversations recently, Yoga Works closing places, right? If you recall. Yes, yeah. And so, and then it doesn't, there's so much that's happened. So Yes. <laughs> You opened your own place. Yeah, I, I took over a, a studio from, from a friend who, who had been running it for a while right. um, in Somerville. And um, I visited you there and we recorded again. And that was in 2016. It was a year later. Yes, yeah. And you and Kate from Unrolled came on and we chatted then. And that was the last time you've been on the show. So it's been like well over three years since then. Yes. <laughs> and I know a bunch of stuff's happened. I know you let go of Bow Street. I know you got licensed as a massage therapist. So I guess I didn't really know where to start. That's so much there. Where I'm curious to check back in with you is I'm curious how the trajectory of Bow Street went for you. Because when I last really just spoke to you one-to-one, you, were, you had talked about potentially having your own place, and then you did. And so yes. I'm curious about what went right there, what didn't go so right there. Why did you let, <laughs> why did you let go of it? Yeah. Um, okay. So I think, you know, one of the reasons why I agreed to, to take over um, Bow Street was, you know, in that, I don't know, two month interim that I was, not managing what what was back bay yoga trying to figure out how am i going to cobble together all of these gigs and this this was like back in like fall winter of 2015 Mm -hmm. um i just kept bumping up against this you know well what style of yoga is it really and and what you know is it can you teach more like a vinyasa class and can you teach more like this kind of class? And can we call it this? It just became this whole like, uh, you know, conversation of, of trying to brand whatever I was doing as something like new and exciting, which to me, it was not in any way new and exciting, especially because most of the teachers that I learned from are well into their sixties and beyond at this point. So it's clearly been around for quite some time. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, this opportunity came open to teach at Bow Street. I was actually already going to start teaching there just as a, as a, as a teacher, um, in 2016. And, um, so that, 
But the, basically the desire to set my own context for practice is what led me to take over the studio and, and, um, and move forward with having my own place. I completely understand. I think we even talked about that where yeah. it was almost like, okay, well, will you teach the level one vinyasa? And you're like, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> vinyasa. But like, well, what do we call your class? Uh, you know, I totally get that. And then yeah. to want to just have a place where you could do what you felt inspired to do without having to be up against that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that it, it, it was from a, from a practice and pedagogical point of view, uh, I am really happy and really proud of everything that went on at Bow Street. Um, I, I like, I really think that um, almost, I don't want to say accidentally, but, but very organically uh, a, um, you know, practice started to happen there and it really had already been happening there, or at least the seeds of it had already been happening there um, before I got there. But, but it really started to develop into a, a um, wonderfully sensitive and intelligent um, group of practitioners. Uh, and the only reason that I, uh, not the only reason, but, but, one of the main reasons I let it go is uh, I just, I couldn't really divide my mind between everything that it took to keep that studio up and running and having to be on call in case someone couldn't make it to the studio and, um, or the toilet would break or the, you know, all of these things that happen when you run a yoga studio, it was just too hard for me to, to split my mind between the work that I really wanted to do uh, as a practitioner, um, and then as a, as a teacher, uh, and to go back and forth was just, was just causing too much stress. And I, you know, it also happened to coincide with the fact that Union Square in Somerville, which is a, the neighborhood that I live in, um, is very, very quickly changing. There's going to be a train stop here eventually, um, which there wasn't before. So, the rent kept going up, you know, steadily every year. And it just, it just became, it just became clear that I, I couldn't take on the level of risk that it was going to become financially to keep going. That was sort of my next question. Like, did you have to come up with a big chunk of money to have it? Did you lose money on the whole thing? Like, have you ever like looked back at it? Yeah, no, I lost money on the, on the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I lost plenty of money on the whole thing. Um, yeah, but you know, I'll pay. I'll I'll make it up. I'll, I'll well. You now, here's what I would say to you because I have the same experience. You know, we talked about this last time too, where you maybe it wasn't like a like a business that you grew and like made a bunch of money off of, but you did accomplish what you set out to do in that you gave yourself a context to figure out what you were doing as a teacher more. Yes. And now that you let go of it and you're out teaching at down under and we had, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Justine. Uh, Justine. Right? Yes. We, I had her on the show back when, so now you teach it down under, but I'm betting that you get to do that a little bit more on your own terms. Uh, yeah, I think so. I also think that, you know, a couple of things, um, you know, I think a couple of interesting things have happened. I think part of the reason why I'm able to continue to teach within my own context at Down Under is because uh, there are, like, there's there's precedents just in the fact that uh, Barbara Baina taught there for so many years and she still is a teacher of mine and has been for a really long time. And then uh, Patricia Walden teaches there uh, and she is married to my teacher, Tom Alden. Um, so like there, there is a precedence and there are other teachers now that, that are sort of studying and thinking about things in similar ways. So I don't really, I, I don't feel like I'm the like 
weird person over there teaching the, mm-hmm. the odd stuff. <laughs> um, well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I had Barbara on and you're, you're carrying on a tradition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, know? for sure. Uh, and, and I think, I think that's one of the things that um, I, I do in many ways think that, uh, you know, down under de- deserves credit for being able to keep that style of practice sort of, at the foreground um, of, of what's being offered. Um, but then I also do think that, uh, and I don't necessarily take credit for this, but just through the relationships that were already in place at Bow Street, which really when I took over was a, just a bunch of Barbara's students um, for the most part. Uh, and then also through more and more people getting to study and, and practice uh, with, with Tom and then um, my good friend Fez Aswat came on board, who's been studying with my teacher for way longer than, than I have. Um, and so there was just like a community of folks that had more of a common, common language around what we were interested in, 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 in practice. Um, so it was kind of the most difficult thing about letting Bow Street go is it felt like that was, finally starting to gain momentum just as the finances started to outpace what I was able to justify. Isn't that amazing, right? Once yeah. like the, <laughs> the heart and soul of a place congeals the real estate. Yes. Buys <laughs> you, you know, that's, that's exactly what happened to me. My place was so in, it had a wonderful community. In fact, you know, with this whole coronavirus thing, it's amazing how many people from back then have showed up to my live stream classes. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It's been yeah. really wild. People I haven't seen in years and years, but you, you do end up developing something in a space with people over time. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes that, that forever going up with the real estate, you can't keep pace. That's what we talked nope. about. <laughs> You've got shelf lives. You know? Yes. And I think, I think that's especially true for any place that has one practice room. Yeah. Like you're just, you're just limited by what you can do in one, in one physical, physical space. And also um, like when you're niching, like yes. you had that one kind of a sensibility of sorts. I mean, I'm, I'm yes. sure there was a lot of variation and in individual. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know you to be someone who's not like dogmatic, Yeah, but at the same time, like a place like down under, they are having all the flavors. A hundred percent. And so that from a business standpoint is uh, much better for business. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it puts you in a better position to meet yeah. the rising rents. Yes. Yes. And getting yourself into a good rent situation, maybe a more stable rent situation. Totally. The, the totally. Solution. But that's not always so easy. No, not at all. <laughs> well, I guess the other thing that I was really thinking about is one of the things that I watched you grapple with is a teacher training program. Yes. And registering the teacher training program. And I know you kind of let it go, your registration, your teacher training program, I think. And I, I have to decide within the next uh, 45 days uh-huh. whether I'm going to hold my registration or not and like meet the new standards they created. And I'm pretty sure I'm letting it go. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not decided whether I'm going to stay registered myself, like as sure, IECP yeah. or whatever. Whatever but, that means. <laughs> that is this means that people are registered they, they come study with me they could get continuing yeah. education credit for it or whatever yeah but i'm curious i know you tried some different things you tried to do it much more of like a mentorship yeah um i tried for it so the the you know i i had taught uh, i don't even remember how many trainings with um my my former uh boss uh lynn Beezer over at um, back Bay yoga. And, you know, I think those trainings, which were like the typical, like 30 plus person, you know, well, I, they, they weren't all 30 plus anywhere from like low twenties to like mid thirties in each training, just depending on what time of year it was and what the format was and all of that. And while I think, um, those trainings were really positive 
social experiences and really positive practice experiences for the folks who took them. I was always like, I don't really know whether we're actually training anybody to be a good teacher, mm-hmm. if that's even possible through this for- format. Um, and so when I took over Bow Street, I decided not to continue with that. Um, but I did, there was enough interest in folks that I started training folks kind of one-on-one and that worked really well and trained a bunch of folks that, that way. Um, many of whom are now out there teaching. And then I did a version that was like a small group. Like we had seven people in the group, which was the same number as my first teacher training, actually believe it or not. And, and I, I, I thought that that went very well too. I do think that my approach to training was always more of like a, a reverse engineered model where I'd say to myself, okay, what's valuable to teach these folks? Okay. Now that I have that, let me see if I can put it through some weird conversion to make it fit into the yoga Alliance standards. And if I could, then great. And if I couldn't, then no, but I was always able to, to essentially present it in such a way that it adhered with their, with their standards. Well, I hear you. I know that when you describe, and we talked about those days of doing those 20 to 30 people trainings at back day, yeah. that was like the heyday of teacher training where yes, indeed, <laughs> they, they were so much a part of the financial engine of those centers yes. that it really, I hadn't initially wasn't thinking about, you know, am I making people better teachers or not? Like initially it was just another class you were teaching in a way, but it was like, or workshop you were doing with extended sure, hours. Yeah. Just like you were just filling hours with material and, you know, I was very earnest as you were to just, okay, well, what are the things that I do? What are the tools that I utilize? How do I share those with people? And, yeah. and But ultimately I came to the same conclusion that you came to that. I can't really, that there's sort of a natural impulse that someone has. Yes. At some point you just <laughs> decide to start doing it. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> you don't really train somebody. They, you know, it's, it's a, one of those things you, you maybe like, you ghost someone and observe someone and then have a model to go off of. But at some point you just jump in, you have to try. And I think, you know, I, the, if trainings are focused around getting people to sort of feel really at home in their own practice, then at least they, you know, if they have that impetus, if they have that drive to teach, then at least they're beginning with, from the point of view of, I'm just going to try and share what I find valuable in my practice. And then when, as it always does, when things go a little awry or people, you know, you folks start to realize that, Oh, just because something works for me, doesn't mean that it works for everyone else. Then they can come to and get help from somebody who's been teaching longer and go, you know, this keeps happening and I don't really know how to, I can't quite figure out how to do this. And then those technical questions about like pedagogy and teaching are way easier to answer as if someone's approaching teaching from that trajectory, then if it's like, here's this, you know, we're going to teach you the five things to say about triangle pose and the five things to say about downward facing dog and the five things to say about, I don't know, uh, butter or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, it, it seems to me that the, the people who come out of trainings like that, who are ready to teach are either people who have been practicing for a really long time or already have some skill in teaching people in some other modality. That's right. So so like they've, you know, they've taught music before they've taught uh, dance before they've taught, you know, they have, they have some skill in communication or maybe they're just a, they have a performance background like an actor or um, like you have um, uh, that there is some communicative skill that's there. And then that propels them um, into into teaching. But these this idea of the, I don't know, it just always seems when I'm on those calls with with Yoga Alliance, um, the various like standards review things and stuff like that, 
it's just like, wouldn't we be better just tearing it all down and starting from scratch again? <laughs> well, that's a conversation because I, I hear what you're saying. And everyone I've talked to who did those 200 hour trainings for years, like we did. Yeah. When we're honest and we have the conversation, they all come to the same thing that you just came to that ultimately there's those people, like you said, who already have a skill set of being a communicator or a teacher. Yeah. And they can pick up the yoga and then be in, in that's an easy transition. But really, if we're talking about a process of becoming a teacher of yoga, it has to start with someone's own understanding of their practice. And like you said, I can't remember the words you used of like feeling at home when their own practice or yeah. rooted or comfortable in themselves in their own skin and in their, and their practice being the facilitator of that. Because if you've able to utilize the tools, that's what you then would have to share, you know? So Precisely. it's not like yeah. somebody can just give you like a, a manual with a bunch of yeah. information that you can learn and then you got it. It has to be filtered through your experience and then your ability to process that experience and like articulate that experience potentially. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing at the idea. I think a couple episodes ago, Kate and on unrolled Kate and I were talking about how many manuals we've either created or collaborated on and how we've never seen one that's actually helpful or useful. Yes, I remember. <laughs> Even the ones that we've created ourselves. <laughs> I know. I never thought of mine as a manual. It was just like resources or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Know? But yeah, there's no, there's no way. So what I did was what you did. I've since letting go of my center, I've trained, I think, two different people and it was all mentorship, one-to-one meetings. Yeah. But I do think that there's something to the groups. There is something to having a small, intimate group of seven to 10 people. As yes. Well. So I think those are all like valuable elements when it comes to learning stuff that might help you if you wanted to be a teacher. Yeah. But I also hear what you're saying about the yoga lines. Cause I've basically exited the conversation for now. Cause I just don't, I don't even know how to be constructive in it. It just, it, yeah. it's, it's a, and I, I know you and I have similar political views too. And it, it, I almost see it as this like, micro example of this macro neoliberal nightmare yes <laughs> I, I don't want to i don't want to inadvertently you know further it like we sometimes do in the media or whatever you know yes. <laughs> so 100%. but at the same time i hear what you're saying i guess it leads me to like the next area i wanted to ask you about as mm-hmm. instead of talking about the yoga lines i don't really want to do that what i yeah, want because that could is, be three hours of <laughs> yeah. what i want to talk about is like some of the issues that the yoga lines are supposed to resolve that they don't and i'll give you a for instance because i know that you you got a license in massage therapy which is like yes. a big deal you went to school for like two years or something right to get this well, that's so in Massachusetts, it usually takes about a year to 18 months, depending on how quickly you get your clinical hours done. I somehow managed to do that in uh, exactly a year. Ooh. And it almost um, it almost broke me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to say, I got to say it almost broke me and probably was why I didn't have the the juice in me to take take. Uh, um, Bow Street for another for another year, mm. um, uh, but uh, well, yes. What was the? What was the? I'm first curious. What was like the kind of calculation? What was it for you? Was it just about having the license to touch, or what? What was it? So one of the things that I learned from so my teacher Tom um, is is a chiropractor by trade. That's that's the license he operates under though he doesn't necessarily practice a ton of you know chiropractic medicine anymore um and uh one of the things that i learned from him is manual therapy um more like soft tissue stuff obviously and it just became clear that if i was going to go forward learning the manual therapy part of what he does that i was going to need a license at some point and so why not do one that doesn't take four years and hundreds of thousands of dollars? Uh, and because he doesn't, you know, most of the stuff, most of the techniques that I, that he utilizes on the table, um, 
you know, I would say about 90% of it is something that a massage therapist could do. And then the other 10% is obviously beyond, beyond the scope of practice for, for that modality. But that was, it it was to get some sort of baseline manual skills under my belt Mm. and, uh, and then also get, get a license, uh, which I still think eventually will come in handy as a, as a yoga teacher, if, if regulation shifts. That's exactly where I was going to go. So my curiosity is that now you have this license in massage therapy, which is a license to touch. And I've had all these conversations. Maybe you heard them about consent and touch in yoga classes. Yeah. And I guess in theory, like initially my thought is, okay, well, just because you have this license doesn't make you like an ethical person. You can yes. still totally <laughs> use your power Absolutely. and touch somebody. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. prevent somebody from doing fucked up shit, you know? Like, no. but I guess the theory is that there would be some recourse that if you did fucked up shit, somebody could report you and you could lose your license. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's some way for someone to report you to whatever the board is that gave you your license. And that, that would be the recourse that we don't have in the yoga world. Correct. Correct. Um, and, and, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is I don't actually even having a license to touch. I still don't touch all that often in a group yoga class. Uh, most of, most of that is done in individual, like one-on-one sessions. So it's not that I was wanting to feel like I had that license to touch so that I could go and give adjustments in the context of a, of a um, yoga class. Uh, partially because if I'm going to put my hands on somebody the the exchange feels weird to be sort of split between trying to work with someone individually and keeping an eye on the room Mm -hmm. um like that that doesn't feel so great um and also you know many many reasons but i think first and foremost is that that just wasn't how i was like in the years that I studied with Barbara, I can think of maybe three times that she's given me a hands-on adjustment. Yeah. When you don't care about poses and alignment so much, like hands-on adjustments aren't that important. Yeah. Now, do I remember <laughs> every single hands-on adjustment she gave me? Yeah. A hundred percent. Because it actually meant like <laughs> <laughs> there, was yeah. there was something there that I wasn't, wasn't quite understanding and, and, and she couldn't actually talk me through it. So she had to use her hands. Um, uh, so I still sort of hold true to that in the the group setting. Um, but in the one-on-one setting, I have found body work to be incredibly beneficial to my own well-being and to my own understanding of my body and to my own healing even. And in your training, was there stuff about like, I mean, about the relationship stuff that happens in touch? Like... Is it all technical muscles and insertion points? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, uh, there is, you know, a certain number of hours of ethics and, and things like that. Uh, was it the most uh, updated? Uh, <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it up to the recent woke Level. No, it was, yeah. it was, it was not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in the slightest. Uh, and there were a number of things that students had to really, uh, myself included, had to really advocate for, mm-hmm. um, saying like, okay, you know, this isn't really the way to have this conversation. A lot of the conversation was had, uh, in a sort of context that was like, if you do this, you will lose your license and get sued. As opposed to, why don't you consider the fact that, you know, you're touching someone mm-hmm. and that, <laughs> that holds a lot of meaning. And depending on people's history of touch, you don't know what, you know, even the slightest little thing that you do could, you know, create a, a situation where someone feels, feels triggered and to, you know, 
try to do what you can to mitigate that and then also know what to do when, you know, that shows up either for you as the practitioner or for the person on the table. And it wasn't, it, it just wasn't a very nuanced conversation in the program that I did. And we kind of had to force it uh, to be a more of a nuanced conversation. Um, See, that's kind of what I'm getting at that. There's, there's sort of like regulation to in some ways abate liability or hold people accountable. Yeah, but it doesn't. (laughs) But then there's like teaching people to be like sensitive to trauma or whatever, you know, like, and those aren't the same. Yeah. Those aren't, those aren't really the same thing. And, and that was, that was very clear. Uh, Now, of course they don't necessarily mandate what is said in those groupings of hours that the schools are supposed to, See, it's the same with. So, hours, yeah. right? So it's this many hours on ethics, but what exactly that means isn't so specific. I, it, there, there is some, there's probably, uh, I don't want to say more. There is specificity. Maybe with the new Yoga Alliance standards, the specificity level is about the same. Okay. Um, but it's, it's still kind of wide open. And if you have someone who's like been you know, it, some of it is just also like a, a generational thing. Like there was all sorts of interesting gendered conversations that would go on in the, in the middle of, of these classes that, you know, just were, you know, myself and, and multiple other folks in, in the um, room at times just kind of had to like, step outside and take a walk because <laughs> it was just like, I can't, I can't function with, with this level of like, you know, just, just disrespect to the people, people in the room. Um, so you're talking about conversations that were happening during your massage therapy training. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, it was, you know, we, it, everyone voiced their opinions when, when it was appropriate to voice, voice their opinions. And, um, and I have to say, none of it was really from the student side. Um, it was all really from the from the the teacher side. So just because you put all of this stuff in place to, you know, make these trainings as sensitive as they can be, isn't going to change the fact that you're still going to have people who, for whom it doesn't it doesn't make sense to them that these considerations should be should be taken. Um, That's really interesting. That's what I did. You know, I told you in the email, I wanted to have a conversation about like gender identity with you and you, you just sort of transitioned there just before we go there fully though, staying on this question I have about like legislation or regulating yoga teachers. Now that you are also a massage therapist, I've also heard you speak kind of like, not so in favor of regulating yoga teachers. So where do you stand? Do you think <laughs> should be regulated? Um, you can say, I don't know, but I'm curious. I, I mean, the, the answer is, the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the answer is, the answer is, I have no idea. Do I think that, um, I think that, beyond the question of whether there should be state federal or independent regulation of yoga teachers there people need to think about what their standards are as yoga practitioners and yoga teachers and not to be dogmatic about what those standards are, but to just, like I think the conversation so quickly goes to either don't regulate it all, let it be kind of the wild, wild west as it always has been, or, you know, full on state regulation. What should those regulations be? And there's no pause to be like, oh, what are we actually doing? <laughs> <There's nobody. laughs> you know, people have to come together. And then I've talked about a lot, like people trying to come to consensus on stuff. But you know what I hear you saying that I appreciate is the idea that in order for it to be like an honest thing, 
it can't be one person dictating to other people what the standard is. It has to be people deciding in themselves what their standard is and then coming together, right? And Yes, and then seeing what the shared... And coming to some kind of mutual agreed upon... And the, and in, in in that way, you know, it might be that certain schools of yoga might decide, okay, we we agree to those standards, but then we have our own standards on top of that. We agree to, you know, another school might be like, yeah, we agree to those standards, but we also have these other standards that we're going to put in place that are above and beyond what the what the um, standard might be. Because the other thing that falls apart so quickly in this regulation is like how are you going to write something that regulates Kundalini teachers and Iyengar teachers and (laughs) Ashtanga teachers and like the specificity is limited by the fact that we're trying to do it with such a vast swath of what yoga is and could be. Exactly. And, and the idea is they're going to be a central authority for some kind of regulation of these many diverse different approaches and traditions. And it just doesn't seem like a possible thing. And then the idea of a central authority inherently means kind of a squelching of certain pedagogical things. Yeah, so I, potentially. I, I remember talking to John Afari about that and she sort of came to a like, she's so fed up with all the abuse. She's like, we got to fucking regulate this shit. And yeah. then, but then when I press her, she was able, she was, she relented enough to say, yes, I see the problems, you know, <laughs> yeah. can be there too. Nobody knows for sure. I guess it is. Well, and then, and then, yeah. you know, a perfect example. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J Brown yoga talks to hear the rest of our conversation. Please subscribe to podcast premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.